How many words are on the screen? One or two? I remember teaching my introduction to philosophy class and just expecting everybody to say two. I was pleasantly surprised when I heard a few people say one and there was that jumble of confusion and I got to sort of act like I was expecting that. Like, yes, that is right. The confusion all stems from a philosophical dilemma. Um, well, it wasn't a dilemma, but the point was to show the distinction between type and token. A token is an instance of a type. So on your screen, you have one type of word, but two tokens, two instances of that same word. You could say that those words instantiate the type of word that they are. They are instances of, in other words. But remember, a numeral just names a number. So numerals act just like words. In the same way, each type of numeral can have an unlimited number of tokens that instantiate it. Pollard makes a point like this, based on his numeral system. Imagine you have two of these guys, right? One numeral here and one numeral here. Well, you have two tokens, but they're of the same type. How do I know? Imagine you destroyed one. I'm not gonna actually burn this up, but pretend I burnt this up. You could say, haha, I've destroyed the numeral. Well, yes and no. I mean, you destroyed a token of the numeral, but you didn't destroy the type of the numeral. And my evidence is that there's another token of that same type right here. Now you may wonder, what if I destroyed all tokens? Would I still have a type? Good question. That has a lot more to do with the ontological status of types. That's a whole different question. If you're interested in that, go check out my Universals playlist on my main channel. But Pollard brings up the question, can there be typeless tokens? Well, based on the way that the word token is defined as an instance of a specific type, no, there can't. That doesn't mean that there must be tokens. That means that if there is a token, it must be the token of some specific type. Now, a little symbolization. In the book, Pollard gives us definition 1.1. If X is a numeral token, we let tau of X be its numeral type. Now, don't get intimidated. You see that little weird squiggle and you say tau, and what the heck are we talking about now? It's just a symbol. And if you're not used to seeing bizarre symbols, then it might make the heart rate palpitate a little bit, right? You may think, man, whoever wrote this must be so smart. But it's just what we've been talking about already, right? A numeral type. That's all tau means. With this symbol, all I'm saying is, hey, everybody, when I write this little squiggle, all I mean is numeral type. So don't get intimidated by weird symbols when we're doing math. The more you study it, the more you realize, oh, this is just standing for something I already understand. Now, why put a Greek letter on it instead of a, a, instead of a Latin letter? Well, check this out. Proposition 1.1. If X and Y are numeral tokens, then tau of X is identical to, is equal to tau of Y if and only if there are exactly as many tally marks in X as in Y. So notice now we use that Greek letter so that we knew we're talking about numeral types when we have that Greek letter. When we're using those Latin letters, we're talking about numeral instances, numeral tokens. And we use this to give ourselves an identity criterion of numeral types. These are necessary and sufficient conditions for these two things to be identical. Now, one caveat. Remember we talked about, are there tokenless types? And that was a question that we said, well, we don't want to get into that just yet, right? That has to do with some other kind of philosophy. Well, we don't want to go ahead and assume that they're not possible. But on this definition, we have a problem, right? The identity criterion assumes that there is a token of that type, but no problem. We just tweak our criterion to make sure we know we're talking about identifying identical types that have tokens. We're not applying this to tokenless types, if they even exist. Another caveat, you might be thinking, but what if there's only one token of it, right? We have an X and a Y. What if you only have one token of it? This proposition mentions an X and a Y, and what if we only have an X? Well, the fact that it says Y doesn't mean it has to be actually different from X, right? So even if we have one token only, this token can stand in for both. Then it would read something like this. If this and this same thing are numeral tokens, then the type of this thing is identical to the type of this thing, if and only if this guy right here has as many tally marks as this guy. So now we have an identity criterion for numeral types. Can we make one for numeral tokens? Well, imagine you have two tally marks here, right? Two different to oh, upside down. Two different tokens. What kind of criterion can I write down? What kind of formula can I write down to know when these two things have become just one token? That is definitely a difficult issue. I mean, is it the fact that these two adhere to each other? Like if I glued these two together, would that become one thing? I had students once to ask me that question. I remember uh, Harnish and, oh, who was, uh, oh, and Shin, right? And these two were 
uh, coming to class together. One of them said, hey, you want to walk together to class? And on the way there, they were asking, "What? when do we become walking together, right? What makes us together? Is it that we're super close to each other? Is it that we're walking the same way? And just like I'm going to do right now in the book, Pollard Punts, right? He says he's not going to deal with it right now. Okay, one more thing. You may have been thinking, well, is there a token of three in the midst of the token of four? Well, yes and no. Physically speaking, yes. That would be something like the word cat is physically in the word category, right? But it has nothing to do with the meaning of the word category. And that way, the physical token of the number three is inside the physical token of number four. But if you think about the word walking, right? You add just a little bit extra onto the end of a word that means something, and you get something that means just a little bit different, a related thing, but a little bit different, right? Same thing here. You, you could have the physical word, right, three, and then you add one more little thing and you get a physical different token. But it's not like the word cannot, right? The word cannot really is just two words that are added up together. And because of the meaning of both, they add to a new meaning, right? That's not what we're assuming here. It is the case that the token of three and the token of one, well, three plus one equals four, and this is a token of four. That is true, but we're not assuming that yet. So when you're looking at these tokens, don't start thinking like, well, did he add these up? We're not adding them up yet. First, we got to put down rules on how to add these things up. All this is doing right now is just naming that number. We're not using those tallies to actually count. So in other words, it's important to keep straight what exactly is a numeral token. A numeral token is an instance of a numeral type, and a numeral names a number.